Professor, thank you for uh, joining us. These are indeed uh, turbulent, momentous times even. Uh, my condolences uh, to you and the Iranian people uh, on the loss of such an important uh, figure in Iranian public life. Uh, it must have uh, grievously wounded the psyche of the people of Iran. Uh, what do you think is likely to happen as a result? These are dark times indeed. I would have liked to uh, wish your listeners and viewers a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, but it's very difficult to speak in such terms under these circumstances. I hope for all Christians and Muslims and Jews and everyone else that the months and uh, the year ahead are filled, are full of much better uh, events and uh, a better world uh, emerges from this catastrophe. Uh, I think that without a doubt the Israelis uh, are trying to escalate. After all, Iran is key to the collective resistance. Everyone knows that the capabilities in Gaza, where it comes from, the capabilities in Lebanon, in Yemen, and uh, the resistance in Iraq, where it is inspired from as well. Just as the United States supports uh, the apartheid regime in its genocide, the Iranians support the resistance. So I think it's two re there are two reasons why the Israeli regime carried out this atrocity. One was because they were simply lashing out. They're angry because they are losing the war on all fronts. Uh, but also I think their Netanyahu would like to see escalation. So while there will be an Iranian response, there will be revenge, but I think the Iranians will formulate it in a way where in which the Israeli regime is punished, but which does not work to the advantage of Netanyahu. Uh, but Iran, in any case, will continue to support Gaza, the resistance, in any way or form that's necessary, as well as the other movements in Lebanon, Yemen, and Iraq. All of them play a key role in preventing the regime from, the Israeli regime, from uh, carrying out further atrocities, as well as keeping a major part of the regime's armed forces in the north, and it is sacrificing its young men. Uh, Yemen, of course, is blocking off billions of dollars of trade, uh, and that is economically punishing the uh, Zionist regime. And of course, the Iraqi and uh, Syrian resistance, which is struggling ag against an illegal U.S. occupation, is really keeping the U.S. in check and preventing it from thinking seriously about joining the Israeli regime, because we all remember during the first few days, the U.S. naval forces came to the region and I think it was as a result of these different resistance groups working together, the U.S. finally held back. So I have no doubt that the Israeli regime will be punished, but it remains to be seen how this takes place. Now, Professor, I hear that uh, and take it on, on board. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's true that the Israelis want to escalate and widen the war because of their clear military failure in Gaza. They have not actually conquered one inch in Gaza. They are still open to attack from the resistance in every square inch of the territory. They are losing a significant number of people, and but for their highly developed uh, medevac uh, procedures, uh, they would have lost dead far, far more, as uh, an important Israeli spokesman said this week, that medical advances and the ability to get the wounded out and 
to a proper functioning hospital quickly has saved many lives, but they have still lost many, many lives in scenes that are almost, I mean, if they were in a war movie, you'd think they, they, they were an exaggeration. We see video of young men literally making their way up to a tank and placing a bomb on it and destroying a multi-million pound tank. We've seen these uh, many times. We see people uh, emerging from under the ground uh, in Israeli armed encampments and filming them walking around before attacking them and successfully disappearing again. And more and more Israeli military and political figures are now openly talking about the sheer impossibility of defeating militarily uh, the Palestinian resistance. So that's one reason, and you identified it. But the other reason is this, isn't it? It's only by widening the war that Israel can directly bring the United States into it. And even someone in his dotage, like Joe Biden, must see the perils of that in an election year. Absolutely. And we have to keep in mind that Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and other resistance groups in Gaza, they have extraordinary capabilities. And that's why, as you point out, the Israeli regime has not been able to secure any part of Gaza neither to the north nor in the central part of Gaza or the south. Now imagine what sort of capabilities exist in Lebanon. Imagine what sort of tunnels and facilities exist in Yemen. The Saudis, with U.S. and British and German and Canadian support, bombed the country for seven years. The Americans helped impose a starvation siege on Yemen. But they failed, and ultimately the Saudis accepted a ceasefire when they saw that their oil and uh, oil facilities and their refineries were being targeted by drones and missiles. So the United States should, has to, I'm sure, recognize that the capabilities in Yemen, in Lebanon, go far beyond anything that exists in Gaza, which is surrounded. The capabilities that exist in Iraq and in Syria have the same uh, ma uh, extra extraordinary dangers for the United States as in Yemen and Syria and Lebanon. And of course, in the Persian Gulf, we know what sort of capabilities Iran has. So the Americans definitely do not want escalation. But no one else in the region wants escalation either. No sane person wants escalation. The Iranians want an immediate ceasefire. The people of Palestine, the people across the region want a ceasefire. The reason why Hezbollah is giving martyrs, well over 100 martyrs, is to for help force the Israeli regime to end the war. The reason why Yemen is striking these ships that are going to and from Israeli ports is to bring about a ceasefire. The reason why the resistance in Iraq and Syria are targeting illegal U.S. bases is to bring about a ceasefire. So it's the Israeli regime that's want, that wants to expand the war. It is Netanyahu who wants to remain in power because he knows that if he is cast aside, if he's removed, that he'll probably go to jail. And it's the Americans and the Europeans that have been supporting this genocide, but that but which also recognize the, the, the huge dangers that exist if the war escalates. Now, France, Italy, and Spain have withdrawn from uh, the great armada announced uh, by Joe Biden for the Red Sea. Uh, I'm not so sure about the mighty Seychelles Navy, whether they're still in there, but it is largely a WASP uh, armada now, isn't it? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant countries are the last ones uh, patrolling uh, the Red Sea. But even they are not in a position to strike against Yemen, are they? No, they are not. Yemen has capabilities that 
far outweigh, as I said earlier, what exists in Gaza, simply because it, Yemen is far larger and it is much easier for them to develop these capabilities, especially now that the Yemeni armed forces, after well over a year of uh, ceasefire, have been able to rebuild their capabilities. We have to remember that Ansarullah, the Yemeni armed forces, the only ships that they're blocking are those that are going to Israeli ports or leaving Israeli ports. They have said from day one that they have nothing to do with international shipping. Ships can go through the Red Sea, they can go through Bab al Mandab and go and use the Suez Canal without any problems. Ships going to and from Europe, North Africa to Asia, all of them can pass through without any fear or concern. It is the Americans and the Europeans that wanted these ships not to go through that region to create a global crisis. So instead of trying to push the Israeli regime to accept a ceasefire, they wanted to push the globe towards a potential economic crisis. But uh, the, the Yemeni armed forces remained steadfast. And they said that we have nothing to do with ships going to and from countries unless countries attack Yemen. So if any of those European naval ships were to attack the Yemeni armed forces, then their ships, their ships would also, their commercial ships would also be barred from using the Red Sea. And that is probably why these very small navies of the European of these European Union countries did not participate in this uh, foolish uh, American gathering of naval forces. Although it is significant, isn't it? And you could say it's a fruit of the Saudi-Iranian rapprochement uh, that Saudi Arabia, despite intense pressure from the U.S., declined to join this armada citing its wish uh, not to jeopardize the ceasefire and the peace process between itself and uh, Yemen. And the UAE, likewise, this was a big diplomatic blow to Joe Biden, yet another one. Yes, and we have to, we have to keep in mind that according to polls, 96% of Saudis are completely opposed to the Israeli regime and are opposed to any form of ties. So that I'm sure is something that leaders in Saudi Arabia, the crown prince, is thinking about. And they are thinking about when there is talk of negotiations uh, and ties with the Israeli regime. Things have changed dramatically. And of course, the United Arab Emirates is under a lot of pressure, even though these states do not uh, take into account public opinion and their family regimes, but 96% is almost a universal, and you, there's uni almost universal opposition in Saudi Arabia. So if they were to join this so-called armada, then how would that reflect uh, in Saudi Arabia itself? And the same is true in the Emirates. I'm sure the Emirates would probably want to join the Americans, like the uh, Bahraini regime, but they well recognize that if they do so, then the drones and missiles of the Yemeni armed forces could destroy the infrastructure of the United Arab Emirates and bring about the end of the regime, a regime which is completely dependent on trade and oil and uh, really a regime that has nothing much else to offer. Now, finally, sir, you're a distinguished professor of American studies. What are you telling your students uh, these days about the likely impact of all of this on the impending US presidential elections? It's, it's hard to say what I've been mostly telling my students is that in future, when the United States preaches about human rights, remember the genocide. When the European Union 
preaches about the rights of men and women and free speech remember the Holocaust in Gaza. When they give a Nobel Peace Prize or some other prize to some person in the global south, always keep in mind that they have an agenda. Otherwise, they are the true enemies of human rights. What I think is the biggest impact, at least globally, is that the United States and the Europeans have destroyed their soft power, what remained of their soft power in this genocide, in this catastrophe that we're seeing live uh, through our cell phones and our desktops and laptops and televisions. And coming alongside a series of catastrophic wars, which the latest being Ukraine and the decline of Western economies, I think the influence of the West is also going to decrease in at a more rapid pace, militarily and economically. But these will have a huge impact alongside the very fact that the United States is now deeply divided inside and that the the state is trying to prevent Trump from coming back to power. So inside the United States, you have a decline in economic fortunes. You see a young generation which is opposed to the crimes being committed in Gaza and the support that the regime is, in Washington is giving to Tel Aviv. But also, you see people in the United States looking at the choice that has been given to them. One is Biden, who cannot speak, who it's not clear how much he, of what he understands of his own words. And then you have Trump, who is uncontrollable, but who is also being marginalized and being treated like an opposition leader in a banana in a banana republic. So I think many young people in the United States today are recognizing the fact that the United States is not a democracy, it has never been a democracy, and it is a country that is guilty of the most horrific crimes against humanity and a unique series of crimes against humanity in the sense that these crimes are being count, carried out in front of a global audience, in, right in front of us, and they are opposing a ceasefire, the regimes in, West, in Europe, in North America, and people will remember that. The younger generation in the United States will remember that on Election Day and beyond. Your students are lucky to have you. Professor Morandi, we were lucky to have you again this evening. Thanks for joining us on the Mother Thank of you. All Talk Shows.